The misfits walked among us, flesh-eating astro-zombies just arrived from Mars. Grave robbers from outer space land in barren fields to steal your children from their beds and indoctrinate them into their violent world. Only ones, lonely ones. It's a transformation with an urge to kill. Prime Directive, Exterminate the Whole Human Race. The Jerry Only Interview by Mike Stacks. They looked like they'd just stepped off the screen of some long-forgotten horror movie. A nightmare shock of ghoulish black leather cool, menacing muscle, and scowling skull-like faces, each bisected by a long black point of hair. The Devil Lock. Live they were chaotic, unforgettable. The stocky, powerful singer, Glenn Danzig, wound tight like a coiled steel trap, howling, snapping in a kind of tense frenzy. Towering on either side, the brothers, Jerry and Doyle, their huge arms savagely attacking their guitars as if their instruments were the last barricade to be broken down before all hell really broke loose and they waded into the crowd tearing and plundering, death comes ripping. The world of dangerous fun. Prime Directive, exterminate the whole fucking place. And the music. There's not been a punk band before or since who could match the power and the fury of the misfits in their prime. They had it all, energy, melody, hooks, all locked together in short, totally original songs filled with images Tom from the pages of EC horror comics, 50s B-movies, and Glenn's own twisted, morbid imagination. Although they didn't release an album until 1982's classic Walk Among Us and weren't widely known until then, the misfits actually date back to 1977, when the first lineup of the band was formed by Glenn Danzig and bass player Jerry Only. The band lasted horn early 77 until Halloween 83, leaving behind a string of explosive records in their wake. Unlike many of their peers, the Misfits' music has endured. Today they are more popular than they ever were when they were together. Collectors pay a small fortune for original copies of their early 7 inches, and bootlegs of all kinds multiply. When Metallica covered two of their songs on an album, they introduced a new generation of kids to the Misfits, and the legend grew. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. More than any other reason, the misfits have prevailed because they created a sound and image that is exciting, entertaining, and wholly unique. The band's breakup in 1983 was a bitter one by any standards. Glenn Danzig's subsequent projects Sowen and then Danzig have given him a platform the other misfits have not been allowed. In interviews, Danzig usually seizes the opportunity to denigrate his old bandmates, belittling their contributions. While there's no denying that the creative vision of the Misfits was Glenn's, the role of the other members was absolutely vital, a fact that this article will make clear. To set the record straight, and to get, for the first time anywhere, the full story of the Misfits, I talked to a man who was a Misfit for the duration, Jerry only. Jerry, or Mo, as he's now known, is a great guy. He comes across as a direct, honest, no-bullshit person. He was totally candid in answering all of my numerous questions. His recollection of events was sharp and colorful and we had a lot of laughs. Our story begins in Lodi, New Jersey. Mike Stacks, what first got you into music when you were a kid? Jerry only, when I was a kid, we used to go see Alice Cooper and Kiss and the Allman Brothers and shit like that. Anything that was at the outdoor concerts during summer vacation. Actually, what made me really want to play was that I saw David Bowie's Diamond Dogs tour in 1974, I believe it was. I think I was a junior in high school. I wasn't one of those people that played their whole life, you know? I actually picked up a bass in March, and in April I did my first show Ha Ha. So it was a real, quick learning procedure. But I think it speaks for itself, I got it down in a relatively short amount of time. When I saw that Diamond Dogs stage show, I said to myself, man, this motherfucker is getting paid for this and I gotta go to work. There's something totally wrong here. Cause I would do that for nothing, you know what I mean? Ha ha. When I saw him I said, how much money is this guy making? At the time it was like 10 or 12 bucks a ticket. It wasn't actually the money though, it was the love of what I saw. I kind of liked the entertainment with the stage show and everything. The music just puts it all together. Mike Stacks, but it was actually a few years later that you actually picked up a bass, right? Jerry only, I got it for Christmas, 
1976, but it came late. I had to wait for it, and I actually got it at the beginning of February. So I practiced for two months and then Glenn and myself formed the Misfits in March of 77. Mike Stacks, how did you meet Glenn? Jerry only, I met Glenn through the drummer, Manny, who played on the first single. I used to hang out with my friends at a park in town. It was like a local hangout, and Manny's house happened to be next door to the park. The side of his house was at the gate of the park, so I would hear them playing and shit and I never thought much about it. Manny was a bit jaw center than the kind of shit I liked to play. He'd go down there and jam to Santana for you and shit like that. And for me, I didn't want to watch Santana play to Santana. Why should I watch Manny play to Santana, you know? Ha ha. So Manny introduced me to Glenn and that's how we formed the band. Mike Stacks, what kind of music was Glenn into when you first met him? Jerry only, I don't know if you know a band called The Adverts? Mike Stacks, yeah. Jerry only, he was into The Adverts, he was into Generation X. We were all into The Damned, along those lines basically British punk. Mike Stacks, what first got you into punk rock? Jerry only, well, I just liked it, you know? I was always a big Ramones fan. We used to go down to CBGB's and stuff and see the Ramones at the time they just had one single out. It wasn't hard right away to just grasp the concept. You looked at them and said, hey these guys are bad, but we're fucking badder than this. You know what I mean? Mike Stacks, right away, what was the sound of the original Misfits, when you first formed? Jerry only, the sound of the Misfits was a very talking heads-ish, Devo type sound, I'd say with keyboards at the time. It was just bass, keyboards, and drums. We didn't have the image yet. We really didn't know what we were doing yet, we were feeling our way in. But we got out there and did it and we played our first show, I think it was April 18th at CBGB's. Mike Stacks, were you opening for somebody? Jerry only, it was actually like an audition night. Mike Stacks, what was your set like to start? Was it all stuff that Glenn had written? Jerry only, yeah. It was stuff like she, cough cool. Bullet was written, cause Glenn actually had Bullet written six years before the band. A lot of the earlier stuff Glenn had ideas for and he was working on it for a while, but it didn't really gel until it really came to be. I mean, ideas are great until you really get them put down and worked out and you work a little bit of a buzz about them and then they become something tremendous as opposed to just a good idea, you know? Mike Stacks, how long after the band first started did you do the first single? Jerry only, not long at all. It actually came out in like, June. Glenn was a stickler at getting in there right away with something. Me, I'm more of a sit back and prepare and practice and get things ready kinda guy. He was like, hey, let's just go. The good thing about just going, you get a little bit of experience of playing shows and stuff like that, but at the same time, I think it distracted us from what we should have been working on. We should have sat down and said, hey, we'll work the band this way, or we'll work the band that way. But over the years it found its own way. Things will find their own way if they're not pushed in a certain direction. Cough Cool was a tentative first step. It builds quietly from the simple pulse of Jerry's bass and Glenn's electric sync piano, the gaps filling up with Manny's complicated drum patterns as the song progresses. It has a dark, intriguing quality, but dancing silk and leather voice somewhere between Elvis Presley and Jim Morrison is the only part already in place in a record that sounds very different from what the Misfits would become. The B-side, She, is a step closer, picking up the tempo and letting Jerry's thumping bass attack give the sparse sound some guts at the bottom end. Later a guitar track was added to She, and it is this version that appears on the Legacy of Brutality album and the Misfits collection. 500 copies were pressed of the original single, though as with all the Misfits records several bootleg versions exist. It caused barely a ripple in the New York punk landscape, but it was an interesting beginning. We switched personnel immediately after the first single, Manny wound up being a drunk and not practicing. The thing was, musically he and I didn't gel too much. I wasn't an experienced musician, so to say, but at the same time, I knew what was cool to play and what sucked to play. 
trying to play shit that's over your head when you're not good enough to pull it off, sucks, you know what I mean? But that was Manny's attitude, hey, let's do solos, I said, Manny, I'm not interested in playing a fucking bass solo. I don't know if you've ever heard a bass solo, but they're very boring. Ha ha. I mean, I like the bass, but I wouldn't want to sit there and sit through a bass solo, and I don't think there should be one just so there's a drum solo if you catch what I mean. Ha ha. So we blew Manny off and we got this guy Mr. Jim. Then Glenn got off the keyboards and we brought in this guy Frank Licata, whose name is Fran Che Coma. Mike Stax, who is Mr. Jim? Jerry only, Jim Catania. He was from Lodi also. He was about the same age as Glenn in that area. Then what happened was, we had a label called Blank Records if you ever notice, Cough Cool came out on Blank. Immediately afterward, Mercury Records came out with a Piro Boo album and put it on a label that they called Blank. But we already had Cough Cool out and nobody knew about it. So legally the release of Cough Cool wound up binding us to the name and put them in jeopardy of being sued by us but we had no money to sue them. They came to a compromise where they would buy the name blank from us for studio time. So we went in and recorded Static, TV Casualty, Angel Fuck, Bullet, Teenagers from Mars A Whole Album. It was supposed to be called Static Age with 13 cuts on 11 the tracks which would have made up the aborted Static Age album showed the new, harder-edged misfits as a band who could easily hold their own against or even surpass their contemporaries. In particular, Glenn's creative songwriting and powerful, wide-ranging vocal dynamics, check out the incredible comeback, for example, set the misfits apart from the pack. The song Static Age and TV Casualty present frightening real-life portraits of the world, as seen through the eyes of a new generation of children raised by the icy blue glow of the television and video screen A theme that lay at the core of the misfit's future direction as B-movie horror mutants. The horror obsession was already taking form in Spinal Remains, Return of the Fly, and, most importantly, an early version of Teenagers from Mars, which portrayed them as nihilistic avenging invaders from outer space. Eight of the Static Age songs can be found on the 1986 Legacy of Brutality album, although clumsy remixing has obscured some of the group's power in a drum-heavy balance. This is particularly evident on the otherwise brilliant hybrid moments, which should be sought out in its original form, on various boots, to fully appreciate its impact. However, the recordings do show that by the beginning of 1978, virtually all the pieces were already in place. Jerry only, that stuff was ready to go when Blondie's first album was out, the Ramones' first or on the way to their second album was out. That stuff was already recorded, but no one understood what it was, you know what I mean? That was one of the problems with the band, was that we were too underground. Mike Stax, yeah. If that would have come out then, you would have been right at the forefront. Jerry only, well, the thing was, if it would have come out then, everything would have moved up five years. We would have been the forerunners of the new scene, instead of the new scene happening in 87, you know? That was the main problem with our band, that we didn't focus and get somebody to sit down and look at the imagery. But, you know, we were a band and we were having a good time, and we could give a fuck, you know? Ha ha. So basically, that was the problem with it. We had some really great stuff ready to go at the same time like Generation X's first album came out, but we didn't get an album out till 82, and then it came out on Slash, and they were pushing fear all the time. What happened was that our thing went right down the tubes. It's unfortunate, but the misfits were doomed to drop out once we didn't get that first project out the door which is why, in a lot of ways, I'm taking my time the second time around. The four-song Bullet EP, on the band's own Plan 9 label after Plan 9 from Outer Space, Natch, was, in a way, the misfits' real debut, consolidating their transformation from the subtle art punk sound of Cough Cool into a roaring, high-speed, guitar-driven punk rock band somewhere between the Ramones and the early Damned. Every song is top-notch, Bullet, an incredible sex and death fantasy about the JFK assassination set to the fury of a gale force hurricane, the stomping, anthemic We Are 138 Hollywood Babylon, a sinuous, mood-drenched look at the evil side of Hollywood, a sinuous, mood-drenched look at the evil side of Hollywood, inspired by Kenneth Anger's book, and the snotty threatening attitude, with the band proving they could employ melody, and even harmony, 
without danger of being called pop. Mike Stacks, not long after Bullet the Horror image really started, right? Jerry only, yes, as a matter of fact, it came in right between Bullet and Horror Business. That's when I came up with the devil lock thing. Mike Stacks, how'd you come up with that? Jerry only, well, at the time when Horror Business was released, I had this electric blue hair not the sissy turquoise color, it was like brand new denim jeans. Ha ha. It was really slick. So I had this thing, my hair started to grow. What happened was, as it got longer I just kept messing with it, so I did this wave thing with it this tidal wave do. And as it got longer it just grew down in the front. Then we did our hair black and that was it. Once we got this horror business thing, all of a sudden we had an identity. We looked good, and all of a sudden the sound was right. Mike Stacks, what did you use to keep the devil lock in place? Hairspray? Jerry only, some hairspray, but at the end, I just wound up using Vaseline, cause the hairspray was really burning my eyes. Mike Stacks, in between bullet and horror business you got Bobby Steele and Joey Image Image. What was the change? How did that happen? Jerry only, the change was that we picked two local boys from the city who were more into the scene. We went on the road with Frank and he couldn't handle the road, it was beyond him. He didn't want to go on the road, and when he did he freaked, so we didn't count on him as a perpetual thing sorta oh yeah, I expect to be touring with Frank 20 years from now cause you couldn't go down the street with him without him going nuts. Ha ha. So eventually we had to do something about that. At the time, I was grooming my brother. My brother Doyle used to roadie for me. So what happened there was later, when Doyle was ready, we brought him in cause Doyle was playing with our band when he was in 8th grade he's younger than me, you know? Mike Stacks, after you got Bobby and Joey Image, it was pretty quick that you did the horror business EP? Jerry only, well, that was 78, we banged out a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. I had to come up with the money for all this stuff that's what hurts. I had to get the band financially off the ground, there was no other source of money. None of these other jerks that played with the band could come up with the money. Mike Stacks, you were financing the records and all that? Jerry only, yeah. I sacrificed a lot to make the band happen. I could have been dumping my money on things for me, instead of things for the band. But I guess you learn your lesson the hard way, you know? By early 1979, when the horror business was released, the evolution of their ghoulish 8 movie image and furious, yet tuneful punk sound was complete. The EP was their strongest performance to date, featuring three compelling songs, the treacherous, careening title track, which featured imagery from Hitchcock's Psycho, You Don't Go in the Bathroom with Me. I'll Put a Knife Right in You, a new, faster, tougher teenagers from Mars and the Desperate Children in Heat. According to the records insert, on February 28, 1979, the Misfits and a mobile recording unit entered an abandoned haunted house in northern New Jersey. They recorded and left. While mixing the tapes back at an NYC recording studio, strange voices and noises were heard in the background. No explanation of these sounds could be given by the band or recording crew. I asked Jerry the story behind the haunted recording session. Mike Stacks, So Horror Business. That was recorded in a haunted house? Jerry only, that shit ha ha. Mike Stacks, what's the story behind that then? Jerry only, what happened was, there was this weird sound on there, and we didn't know where the hell it came from. So we said, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna remix it? I said, well, I ain't got no more money. This is it. You gotta like what you got. We thought about it, and we thought, we don't want everybody to think we're a bunch of jerks. So I think I mentioned it, let's just say it was recorded in a haunted house. Everybody will love that. Ha ha. Mike Stacks, I kinda suspected there was an element of bullshit involved. Jerry only, well, there was actually weird shit on there. We were just covering up for that. Mike Stacks, you mean the noises at the end of Teenagers from Mars? Jerry only, yeah, might be. It sounds weird. I don't even remember exactly what it was, but that was my answer to the problem, rather than given more money to do it again. 
Mike Stacks, I heard that Glenn claims he played guitar on that record. Jerry only, according to what I heard, Glenn goes around telling everybody that he re-recorded all the tracks on guitar so he can say he doesn't owe anybody any money. Now, on horror business you may be right, cause I don't know if Bobby knew how to play it. He may have, but Glenn's not really a good guitar player, to be honest with you. He can fake his way through a Buddy Holly song or something like that, but as far as being a guitar player, that, he is not. He comes up with some halfway decent chords that are offbeat, like the beginning of Earth AD. And shit like that, but he's not a good guitar player. So there was a point down the road where Glenn was going, oh, I'm going back to the studio to re-record everybody's guitars and everybody's basses. Why? Has he got nothing better to do? Mike Stacks, well, you'd be able to tell if he redid your bass parts, right? Jerry only, I heard one that he claimed, and L heard my bass right on there, so I know that's just a lot of shit. But my lawyer says it doesn't matter what he does. He can shit on the tapes if he wants, so, you know what L mean? Ha ha. It's past history, so he can do whatever he wants. Mike Stacks, what happened between Horror Business and Night of the Living Dead? Jerry only, pretty much dead wood, local gigs. At that time we were in the New York punk scene. Between projects and between big gigs, there's lots of running around. You're going out to clubs and seeing other bands. You're hanging here, you're hanging there. Everybody would go see the gash if they came to town, or the jam. That was pretty much our bopping around time. That's when we had Bobby Steele and Joey Image in the band. They were local boys, they used to hang around the city all the time. You didn't have to drag them out to go out, you'd run into them. Mike Stacks, when this was going on, you guys were still working day jobs? Jerry only, oh yeah, except Glenn. Glenn doesn't work. He never did. That was one of the problems we had too. The thing was, he wouldn't have respect for what anyone was doing because he didn't know what it was to get the fuck out to work. The next record, in October 1979, was another three-song R on Plan 9. Night of the Living Dead continued where horror business left off, although this time the performances were a little rougher. The title track allied a great sing-along melody with fantastic lyrics that mixed comic book humor with gory, ultra-violent images, stumble and somnambulance pre-dawn corpses come to life armies of the dead survive armies of the hungry ones. Only ones, lonely ones ripped up like shredded wheat only ones, lonely ones be a sort of human picnic. On the B-side, where Eagles Dare includes the timeless chorus hook, I ain't no goddamn son of a bitch you better think about it, baby, while the band's sense of fun ran amok on an anarchic rave-up version of Rat Fink. Kidnapped from an Alan Sherman B-side. M.S. Night of the Living Dead was the first Misfits record that was the title of a horror movie and there was a lot of them after that. You guys were real big on horror movies? Jerry only, oh yeah. And that was when the band was at its best, to be honest, with you. The band was really cranking at that point, cause that's what it was, it was a 50s horror band. If we would have marketed it that way, we could have done very well. Mike Stacks, whose idea was it to do Alan Sherman's song Rat Fink on that EP? Jerry only, well, we were all into the models at the time those Big Daddy Roth models so we just figured we'd cover it. At the time, we were all into wearing Rat Fink shirts and things like that. I didn't like that cover that much. It could have been a lot better. I think Bobby Steele's guitar just sounds like shit the playing on it. But what are you gonna do? In my opinion, we could have done a better Jerry on live of it. Mike Stacks, in 79 you toured England with the Damned. Jerry only, yeah, that was a hell of a lot of bullshit. The thing is, I don't like working for people. I don't know if you get that about me. I'd rather work for myself and struggle along, than give myself a bad attitude cause somebody's telling me what to do. In England, we ran into a lot of trouble a lot of people bossing you and shit, and fucking with your sound, trying to make you look stupid so the damned would look better, you know what I mean? Mike Stacks was that the damned personally or their road crew? Jerry only, their whole management, you know what I mean? They were just a bunch of fucking jerks following, nothing against the guys, but at the same time, 
they have no authority to say whether the bus is gonna turn fuck in left or it's gonna tum right? When we're getting fucked over nobody's got a say and that's what aggravates the piss out of me. If I'm in the band, the record company's gonna work for me ha ha, and that's the different attitude I have about the situation. So we got shit on. They burned us on money. And we're in England. Don't go fucking burning the band on money when they're in another fucking country. Cause you can't do nothing. It's not like I could pick up the phone and call my lawyer. Mike Stacks, what was the reaction as far as the crowd? Jerry only, they were a bunch of assholes. Ha ha. If I could find the plug, I'd pull two out and let the whole island sink. Laughed. R, at the time, it was a bunch of little kids who were getting into spitting and throwing shit at you. You ran into a lot of those clowns, you know? Mike Stacks, do you think there was some hostility because you were Americans? Jerry only, yeah, there was that too. Mike Stacks, so what happened with the tour? Jerry only, we walked off the tour because the guy was supposed to pay me $100 a night for the band, for 25 shows in 28 days. That was 2500 bucks the whole tour came down to the money. So I'll work day and night to get the money from my old man to pay for everybody's plane ticket to England. I didn't even get to practice for three fucking weeks before I went. I wanted to go to England with my shit together, and that was one thing I was deprived of, I think. So we got there, and we played two or three shows, and the guy, he was handling Motorhead at the time, and he was handling the damned. He fucked us on the money. He said, well, basically, I'm not paying you guys and we were in the middle of fucking Northern England somewhere. And we just said, oh, pretty easy, fuck you ha ha, and we split. We walked off the tour. Cause we weren't gonna play for nothing. I wasn't gonna let this guy fuck us over. So we split. Mike Stacks, so what's the story with the song London Dungeon? Jerry only. I knew Sid Vicious Mom so I hooked up with Sid's mom when I got back into London and she took me on a tour of Canterbury Cathedral all the really cool places, you know? And Glenn went to go see the jam. Believe, play at the rainbow, and a bunch of skinheads started a fight with him, so he pulled a piece of glass out of a window and started going at him with a piece of glass. So they locked him up. So that's where he came up with London Dungeon. He couldn't wait to get out of England. I didn't like England very much either. I just thought we were treated very rudely for being foreigners, you know? When people come by me, hey, I make sure you eat, I make sure you're cared for. At my house in Lodi, when we used to have the band, Black Flag used to sleep over, Circle Jerks, everybody who came to town had low flop at my house. And we would feed everybody too. Nobody would have to go in their pockets when they went low my house. That's the way I like to treat people, and when Dave Vanian came over here I tried to treat him the same way. But when we were over there, we were at the mercy of those fucking swindlers. Mike Stacks, so how did you get to know Sid's mom? Did you know Sid? Jerry only, I met him the night he died. It's just a bad memory. I shouldn't have let the shit happen that I saw happen. I tried to keep my peace. You know what I mean? If it's not my business, I stay the fuck out of it. But if you see something you think is bullshit, I guess it's better to speak your opinion. So that it doesn't lay heavy on you later. Mike Stacks, was it the people he was hanging out with? Jerry only, yeah. I mean, the guy just gets out of jail, they go and hook him up with some dope and shit. I didn't know what the fuck he was doing. And he keeps on passing out and shit. And then he was alright, you know? So we split, and we were saying, you know, what a hairy scene. The next day I had to drive up to Connecticut to drop off some parts and I heard it over the news. It said he was dead. I said, son of a bitch. I could have just picked up the phone and called an ambulance. Fuck em. Rather than become an asshole, in my own mind, I became a real asshole by not selling anything. Mike Stacks, well, there were a lot of other people there and he was probably like that many nights, you know? Jerry only, yeah, but it's a shame. At the time, we had just seen him, he'd played at Max's Kansas City, and he had the world by the balls, you know what I mean? Mike Stacks, back in England, 
that was when Joey Image left the group, right? Jerry only, as a matter of fact, he blew us off. The thing was, he was missing his girlfriend, so he couldn't make it over there and he just wanted to get the fuck out. He was just a bad vibe for the band. It was a bad move getting him he was just a fucking bum. Mike Stacks, what happened when you got back from England? Jerry only, when we got back, we were in pretty much of an uproar there, and then he got Googie in the band. Basically, every time we turned around we had a new band, you know? It was a never-ending battle. Mike Stacks, what was the story with getting rid of Bobby Steele? Jerry only, well, one, he was a jerk, two, we were doing this big show at the Irving Plaza on Halloween and I built these 8-foot coffins with lids on them. So the way the show was supposed to start was that we were supposed to hit the beginning of 138 and just start smashing out of these things, and then everyone gets to the front and starts playing, you know? So I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking about it, and I thought, wait a minute, Bobby can't get the fuck out of this fucking thing if I put him in. Ha ha. Cause he's got a bum leg. I said, look, there's no way this guy's gonna be able to get out of there. It's a shame, but it's true. Then, when we were working on the album which was right before that he kept coming to the recording late, then not being able to keep up. Then Doyle would have to play his part so then I said to myself, why am I sitting in the studio, paying the money for the studio, okay? Bobby comes late, and he can't play when he comes. So why am I waiting for him to come? It's one thing if you're waiting for somebody and they come in and play the whole fucking thing and walk out of their way ahead of schedule, you know what I mean? It's another thing if you've gotta wait an hour and a half and it's costing you 20 or 30 bucks an hour at the time, that was the going rate and the guy shows up an hour, an hour and a half late, and then he can't get one song after two hours of paying money. So you're paying a hundred bucks for someone to come in and fucking basically jerk you off. So you say to yourself, well, fuck it. Next time Bobby's not here, Doyle, you're playing. Fuck it. So Bobby actually messed his way right up to get in the axe. He may tell you differently, that everybody had it in for him but basically, he wasn't cutting it. And I know he doesn't want to hear that. Mike Stacks, so when Bobby was fucking up, you were recording the tracks for what eventually became Walk Among Us? Jerry only, yeah, but Bobby kept showing up late or he'd show up with no strings on his guitar and not have strings, and steal Doyle's strings, or play Doyle's guitar and use Doyle's amp. So why the hell am I waiting for Bobby? Ha ha. So fuck it. Bobby. Take your guitar with no strings, put it back in your case, and get back on the bus and go wherever the hell you gotta go. Don't let us hold you up. Ha ha. By the time Three Hits from Hell was released in April 1981, it had been more than a year and a half since their weight record. There had, in fact, been numerous recording sessions during this lime, with the band working on material for an eventual album. The songs on three hits were drawn from some of these album sessions, featuring the first appearance of Doyle on guitar, but with Bobby Steele credited for extra guitar on London Dungeon. London Dungeon, inspired by Glenn's experience in England, is perhaps the most unique track the Misfits ever did. It's a dark, atmospheric number, anchored by Jerry's ominous, churning bass line and a simple, deep reverberating guitar riff, it's circled by coils of sinister feedback and eerie background voices, over which Glenn delivers a masterful vocal performance. The B-side tracks Horror Hotel and Ghoul's Night Out, the latter with pounding, almost Dave Clark 5-type drum thump age, were more typical, but well up to par. The addition of Doyle to the lineup not only stabilized the band, it also gave the Misfits image a new symmetry, with the big, warrior-like Kayafa brothers flanking Glenn's shorter figure, making for an unforgettable frontline visual effect. The Misfits image now became more defined, devil locks grew longer, physiques grew more powerful, and their clothes took on a more unified look, incorporating their skull logo, from the Crimson Ghost, and leather gear equipped with huge metal studs and spikes which the brothers made at their factory jobs. Mike Stacks, now when Doyle joined the Misfits in 81 he was only 15 or 16 years old. Was he still in high school? Jerry only, yeah. Mike Stacks, what kind of reaction did he get from the other people in his school? Jerry only, well, we had our problems with the faculty and shit, but the kids thought it was great. 
when he was in 8th grade he had pink hair, and they wouldn't give him his diploma, and my mom had to go down and get it and shit. That was in the papers I got a write up on that. Ha ha. So they weren't too psyched at Doyle. But that's what he wanted to do. Not too many people understood it, but that's what Doyle was into, and he wanted to play guitar so he did. He was in school, and he was playing football and all the normal things like he normally would, but in the summer we would just go on the road, cover our ass at work and go take off on tour. The next release turned out to be a Glenn Danzig solo project, Who Killed Marilyn? B.W. Spook City USA released on August 5, 1981, the 19th anniversary of Marilyn Monroe's death. The Misfits had already recorded the song much earlier, but according to an interview with Danzig and Thrasher the others weren't interested in releasing it, so he redid it as a solo project. The Misfits version can be found on Legacy of Brutality, and it's a bristling indictment of the Marilyn cover-up, which easily trounces Glenn's credible but stiff solo version. Mike Stacks, what was the story with Glenn's solo single? You guys didn't want to do that song? Jerry only, no, I had no problem with it. I don't know what the hell he was doing. I think he wanted to play some guitar, I dunno. Mike Stacks, in an interview in Thrasher, Glenn said that you guys didn't want to do that song anymore and so he did it himself. Jerry only, that I'm not sure. I don't remember. I think he was looking for something different out of it. Whatever the case, I don't actually remember, but that was him and the guy across the street from us. Glenn's solo experiment was the sign of some dissent in the band, it was quickly put behind them. Three months later, on October 31st, they released a great new single, Halloween a rousing horror show screamer that soon became a live favorite. On the B-side, its evil twin, Halloween 2, has darker demons lurking, which Glenn would conjure up again in Samhain. It also reflected Danzig's growing interest in the occult. By now the Walk Among Us album had basically been completed, and there was some frustration that after almost four years they still didn't have a full-length record out. Finally, in early 1982, the band made a deal with Slash Records, for a one-off LP on their Ruby subsidiary. Mike Stacks, how did you get the deal with Slash Slash Ruby for the album? Jerry only, basically, we had to beg them to put the fucking thing out. Ha ha. As funny as it may seem. Mike Stacks, did you get paid up front for the recording costs? Jerry only, no. We got ripped off up front. Ha ha. Mike Stacks, so what was the deal they gave you? Jerry only. The deal was that they'd put it out. If we did get reimbursed, we paid about three grand for studio time. So if we got reimbursed, they gave the money to Glenn, cause I never saw any of it. Then they had this guy Chris D, who used to be with the Flesh Eaters, he remixed it for Slash. He was working for Slash at the time. So he still gets paid off of that too. At one point we sold 70,000 copies in two weeks when they re-released it. We were number five in the country for two weeks. Then we were right back off as quickly as we were on. Walk Among Us stands as probably the ultimate Misfits record, a thrilling, livid depiction of their horror movie vision of the world, pummeled across over 13 tracks of violent punk rock and roll. The highlights include the rabble-rousing hate breeders, the brutal, wrenching all hell breaks loose, and the brilliant Astro Zombies, with just one touch of my burn in hand slash I send my Astro Zombies to rape this land slash prime directive, exterminate. The whole human race. This, and other tracks like I turned into a Martian and their tribute to horror movie mistress and plan 9 from outer space star Vampira, employ their B-movie obsession to the hilt, while mommy, can I go out and kill tonight and brain eaters show a fiendish sense of humor is also at work. Walk Among Us shows just what it was the misfits had that other punk bands couldn't hope to match, originality and imagination in their lyrics, fitting in with their unmistakable image, powerhouse musicianship, including a singer who could actually sing, and songs that went way beyond the simplistic formula riffs of 95% of their peers. Glenn Danzig's songs have real melodies that soar and dive over crafty, intelligent chord changes, a song like Skulls, for example, is unmistakably punk rock, yet the structure could more easily belong to, say, an Elvis or a Dion and the Belmont song than to something by the Pistols or the Circle Jerks. And that's why the Misfits music connects in a way that your average Rama Lama punk band never could. 
Unfortunately, instead of being a launching pad, Walk Among Us turned out to be a peak. Mike Stacks, what do you think of Walk Among Us, the way it came out? Jerry only, to tell you the truth, I think it's the best thing we did, you know? The problem here was that it was a stepping stone, and no one internally wanted to accept that as what we were and what we would be. In other words, it wasn't time to draw a tangent, it was time to go forward. And that was the demise of the band after that point. Glenn wanted to get heavily into this thrash stuff, and, I wanted more songs like Astro Zombies and Hate Breeders. If we had three albums with two or three more songs like that on each one, we would have been in. And you're not gonna get there with Wolf's Blood. Death Comes Ripping is a good song, but it's not an Astro Zombies. Ha ha. And that was the band. The point in the road was getting to the walk among us and then becoming better, but everybody missed the point. I saw it, it was clear as the nose on my face. I said, shit, this is us. That's when the image had taken hold, and that's when we did that evil live stuff. We were there. Mike Stacks, and that's when you were doing a lot of touring and stuff, so you had a pretty high profile. Jerry only, right. We were prime time. Right then we should have got picked up. You see, slash, they wanted to write us off as a quick investment and a quick buck, instead of taking it to the potential. Mike Stacks, where did you tour? Did you go all over the USA? Jerry only, yeah. We did about three or four trips over the whole country, we circled it. We usually started high and came back low go across the top, go down the west coast, then down through the south, and back up the east coast. We got around. It was good. There was a lot of money that came over the doors and I would pick up the tab all the way round, most of the time. So any money the band was making was going right back into the band. Mike Stacks, what incidents stick in your mind from being on the road? The band had a reputation for a lot of violence. Jerry only, well, you know what it was? Every time we played, we were ready to play. We were psyched, you know. You'd get that knot in your stomach. And when we played, there wasn't ever a time when there was an audience so small that we didn't want to go out and still kick ass, you know what I mean? Who was there or what was there had no bearing on it. It could have been the Hollywood Bowl or it could have been Al's Bar it didn't matter. And I think that was one of the good things. Everybody loved what they were doing. When we used to play, I would stand up until 4 or 5 in the morning if we got off at 1 o'clock or something and not be able to sit down, just keep walking back and forth saying, oh man, that was so great. Cause we were into it, and we were playing from the heart. That was what the band was all about it was about doing what you believed. Unfortunately, it all came to a peak out in that one time, you know? At that point, Glenn lost sight of what really should have been done and I knew what should have been done. We should have just kept our image, made our shit lighter, made our equipment better, bought our own sound system, bought our own light system, and stayed on the road. Mike Stacks, you know, you were talking about being pumped up when you went on stage. I have a video of a show where you smash your bass on the first song. That's fucking insane. Ha ha. You always see bands smash their equipment at the end but you smash yours at the beginning. Jerry only, yeah, I remember one time I forgot to plug one in and I got real aggravated and smashed it up, and then I saw the cord was laying on the ground and I felt like a jerk. Laughter. Mike Stacks, were you going through a lot of equipment at that time? Jerry only, we played one show with Black Flag at the Santa Monica Civic Center. Doyle and I both went through about $2,000 worth of instruments. We were buying them for a buck and a quarter, $125, so, it was about 8 guitars and 8 basses and a 45-minute set. Ha ha. So I don't know what that figures out to be in minutes. Mike Stacks, that's like one every two songs or something. Jerry only, yeah. That's what it was. But the thing was to do it quick and to get it out of the way. It was an actual, like, karate chop thing, you know? You would smash it and it had to go on the first shot, otherwise, you'd look stupid. Mike Stacks, what kind of bass was that anyway? Jerry only, I was playing Rickenbackers then. I would cut it all up and glue the headstock on. I did all that myself. 
Mike Stacks, that's an amazing looking bass. Do you still play that? Jerry only, no. I made a much nicer one. We're making a guitar called a Rand guitar. It's an excellent piece of equipment. It's just the thing is we don't have the time or the money to invest to get it off the ground. Otherwise, I think we could make a real shitload of money with them. By the time the Misfits started to tour and gain some national recognition in 1982-83, punk had given way to hardcore. It was a scene the band never fitted into. The Misfits were punks in a more traditional sense, they refused to play by the rules. To them, anarchy didn't mean some kind of utopian political manifesto, it meant Chao 6, disorder, and no holds barred fun. While a thousand bands yelled tuneless rants about Reagan, for the misfits it was horror business as usual. Their music had no political agenda. They were about pure, unbridled energy, dangerous fun, entertainment. Sometimes fantasy and reality blurred and it all spilled over into real blood and violence, hey, that was just too bad. One incident, in particular, did much to alienate the band from the hardcore scene. Mike Stacks, going back to you guys on tour, there were a couple of incidents that are now legendary. The one that everyone still talks about is the gig in San Francisco at the Elite Club. Now, what happened there? Jerry only, well, basically justice was served I'll hate to say it. We had gone to this show, and we had to fly all the way to San Francisco, just to do this one show, okay? We were down in L. A, we flew to L. A, and then we drove up to Frisco to make the show. There were 10 bands on the bill, and every band that gets up there is getting full cans of beer thrown at them and they're getting beat up. And they're just yet and it happened, and they're trying to smile and shrug it off. So I'm all pumped up, and I'm watching from the balcony, and I turned to the guys and I said, listen. I don't know about you guys, I said, but the first motherfucker who hits me with a can of beer is gonna wear me for a fucking coat. Ha ha. You know what I mean? Cause I didn't come all the way here to get abused. So, okay. Two starts wind and down, so we go on. So we're playing and we're playing four songs we're banging them out then the kids start acting up, you know? So then there's this one kid in front of Doyle, and he's throwing full cans of beer at Doyle's head, as hard as he can just out of reach, he can't grab him. So I'm watching this kid out of the comer of my eye, and I keep saying to myself, soon as this set is done, as soon as it's done, I'm not gonna throw my guitar against the wall, I'm gonna jump out of it and jump and grab this motherfucker and kick his ass. That was what was on my mind. And as I'm thinking that Googie jumps right over the drum kit, right out into the crowd in one leap, and punches this kid in the face. Because the kid was just trying to hurt somebody. So he punches the kid in the face, and the kid goes flying back into the soundboard. So Googie goes chasing him and we're still playing, you know? Ha ha. Well, what happens is, this real big guy grabs Googie and Googie can't get free. So my brother was room in the sound there's a brother between me and Doyle so he goes running over and smashes the guy in the side of the head, you know? And he lets Googie go, and then my brother takes over because he said the guy was like a monster. So he starts running, and the guy couldn't catch him. So Googie gets free and he grabs the kid again cause he was really pissed off, cause he was watching this kid too and he hits him in the face, and the kid comes flying from the soundboard back into the stage. As soon as he hits the stage, Doyle smacks him on the head with his guitar. Ha ha. And the kid, oh, there was blood everywhere. His guitar got fucked up and the whole thing, you know? And the whole place went quiet when they heard the kid get kicked in the head, cause everybody was like grabbing each other and pulling and shoving and shit, and we're looking around, once this kid got hit, everybody shut up, and we're all looking at the kid going, holy shit. Everybody the crowd and us everybody, was just standing there with their mouth open, cause it just got out of control. And then the next thing, this big dikey chick goes. You killed him. Ha ha. And the whole place broke out into a fucking mad riot at that point. Ha ha. Mike Stacks, so how did you get out of there alive? Jerry only, well, the thing was that we had no problem walking off the stage it was just senseless, you know? There was actually, like, a thousand of them and four of us, so I mean, it would have been a hell of a time. You they would have really understood the odds, 
they wouldn't have hesitated, you know what I mean? They could have easily got us, but we just stood them off and then went up to the dressing room, which in the elite club is up on a balcony. And then there's this stairway, and you can only fit one person at a time up the stairs. So I said, well, look, if they come up one at a time, we'll throw them down onto the floor ha ha. They can only come at us one at a time, and between the four of us, we'll just pick that person up and throw him off the balcony onto the fucking floor. Ha ha. It was fucked up. It just got out of hand. Mike Stacks, so you guys never played San Francisco again? Jerry only, no, we never went back Mike Stacks, I read somewhere that you were all arrested for grave robbing in New Orleans. Jerry only, you're pretty well informed. What happened was, we played for this guy, he was a mercenary. He was booking stuff in San Francisco and then he moved down to New Orleans. He called us up and he said, hey guys, I'm booked in this new club. It was called Tupelo's, I believe. He said, listen, I'm trying to get some big bands in here, but it's kind of a small place. You guys could pack it, why don't you stop in? I say, all right, what the hell? So we went down there to play, and we did a pretty cool gig. It was a cool show. And they said, hey, down here they bury everybody outside in these mausoleums, so why don't we go and take a look? We'll show you what the graveyards look like. We said, all right, cool. Let's go. The one thing was, this guy had a Harley Davidson, and what we didn't know is that we drove into the worst section of the United States. There's a murder there every two minutes or some shit like this. So we pulled into this place and it's surrounded by projects you know, like apartment buildings and, there were these two graveyards, maybe the size of a football field 100 yards by 100 yards square. So there's two of them, and there's this big long alleyway like a straight road that goes right down the middle and connects the projects with the train station and main street. So we park in the middle of this thing with the guy with the bike. When we're in there we get surrounded by cops, okay? Like the whole place. The cops are going with the searchlights, and everybody's ducking and trying to stay away and shit. So the thing was, I didn't see the harm in it, you know? Hey, look, we're fucking checking out a graveyard. What the fuck? You want us to leave? We'll leave, you know what I mean? So I hop over the wall and go and talk to our friendly officers, you know, and bang, they got me up against the wall, spread your legs, lean on the wall the whole deal. By the time they got the whole band, a couple of them got away. They ended up bailing us out and shit. But what wound up happening was that the cops had a field day, they had a bunch of fucking northern boys down there and they caught him in a bad spot. Mike Stacks, well, they probably took one look at you guys in the graveyard. Jerry only, yeah. We kind of threw him too. We explained, hey, look, we're in a band. Our buddies want to take us around, what are you guys doing out here? Drinking and doing this, oh yeah, we had two six packs of beer with us. I mean, we weren't out there making a mess, but they didn't buy it. Mike Stacks, did they press any charges? Jerry only. Well, the thing was, we bailed ourselves out. We were supposed to appear in court the next day, and the problem was, when we got out we had a show that night in Hallandale Beach, Florida, and the club was right on the beach, and they gave us a free room in a hotel. So, if you think about it, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna play a club on a beach in Florida? Or are you gonna wail for court the next day? What are you gonna do? Mike Stacks, well, you're gonna play, right? Jerry only, you're damn right. Ha ha. So we blew town. Mike Stacks, you made a video for Brain Eaters and another song, right? Jerry only, we were working on one for Skulls, and it never came out. We had done some tapes, we were doing some effects with Skulls blowing blood out of them and crap but it never gelled anyway. Mike Stacks, what's the story behind the Brain Eaters one? Jerry only, well, the Brain Eaters song was sort of like a horror chant song, and what happened was that we went up to Boston. A buddy of ours had a restaurant actually a very famous restaurant and they were renovating the third floor, and they allowed us to go in there and set up all these tables. They gave us all the china and the glasses and the beer, and whatever we wanted for the video, 
and they shot the video for it. All the bands from Boston came down and sat around, and anybody who was anybody wound up getting in the video. It was just like good clean fun. Mike Stacks, what did you use for the brains? Jerry only, er, brains. Ha ha. Mike Stacks, cow brains or something? Jerry only, yeah. Mike Stacks, what bands were sitting around the table with you? Jerry only, that I'm not even sure. I never used to get too buddy buddy with anybody. Mike Stacks, what other bands were you friends with? Jerry only, we were friends with the Necros out of Detroit. We were friends. With Black Flag in California, Cro-Mags out of New York, basically, anybody who was playing along the same lines as we were. Mike Stacks, when Glenn wrote the songs, how did he present them to you at practices? Jerry only, he'd just bring him down and go, let's go from here to here. Mike Stacks, did he get out a guitar and do that? Jerry only, not really. Mike Stacks, he'd just tell you the chords? Jerry only, yeah, e, a, and whatever, and we would come up with the cut, and the arrangements. And stuff like that. That's why, to an extent, it kind of bugs me that we never got any credit for anything. Half the great cuts and drum cuts were me and Doyle and the drummer working them things down but such is life. What are you gonna do? Ha ha. Mike Stacks, tell us a bit about the Fiend Club. People would send you weird shit like skulls and stuff. What was the weirdest stuff you got sent? Jerry only, Tesco V from the Meat Men sent me a dead tarantula, and man did it stink. Ha ha. I just remember it, not because it was the most vulgar thing ever got, it just smelt so bad. Ha ha. We were afraid to open the box. Something's fucking dead in there. What is that? So we opened the box. And we were all expecting to find something really fucked up, and it was Tesco's spider his spider had died. At the Lime, we had this place called the Pit, and the Pit was in my basement in Lodi. We took all these shag rugs in black and red, and then I made L. Eel less than E a bat wing platform with bars in two, cement walls, I had like this dungeon room in the back. I took the whole downstairs of this two-family house and made this real plush dungeon thing. And what I did for the shelves, was I took pieces of 4 by 8 plywood and I would cut long bends in it. So you would put four of them in a row and it would come together as points, and I chained them to the beams in the ceiling. So the shelves were four feet wide, they stuck out at the points, and it was like bat wings all around the corners. We had all our toys and our robots up on there and shit it was great. Mike Stacks, where's all that stuff now? Jerry only, well, I still got all that stuff, but the room has been busted up. We sold the house and we moved up here. We live in the country now, which is cool. Instead of having one house, we got four or five. I got my own place, my mom's got her own place, my grandmother's got her own place. We all used to live together before I was married and shit. Me and Doyle used to hang out downstairs, my mom and my other brother had the middle, and then my grandmother was upstairs. But now everybody's got their own place, and it's cool, and we've got our own factory, and that's cool we're moving along. I don't regret what I had to do. It's just a shame the greatness doesn't exist. I really don't mind too much that I don't have all the fucking money. But, you know, that's money, you can't wipe your ass with it and you can't eat it. In 1983, Googie left the band and was replaced by Robo from Black Flag. Mike Stacks, why did Googie leave the band? Jerry only, well Googie and Glenn didn't get along, okay? The reason being, Googie wanted to get paid. Ha ha. You see, Gooby and Glenn would fist fight over things. We were out in California one time, right? And things were getting suckful, it was getting really bad and shit. There was no money, the gig sucked. We didn't get the money we were supposed to make. I borrowed three grand to put on the tour, from my old man, and I was going bait with nothing. Basically, the tour fucking flopped. And Gooby wanted two cheeseburgers instead of one, you know? The thing was, him and Glenn had a fist fight. Me and Doyle said, hey, you two guys better just sit down. One his sucks enough. 
you guys are fighting over cheeseburgers, I gotta go back and tell my old man I blew three grand. It's one thing for you guys to fucking argue over a 59 cent McDonald's fucking cheeseburger, I said. We've been living on my old man's credit card out here, and we're up to about three grand and we got nothing to show for it, you know. So Googie and Glenn had an argument at that time, and pretty much Googie told him to piss off, and I don't blame him a bit. If Doyle wasn't in the band at that point, I probably would have packed it up too, you know? The most important thing is that it's fun. If you're having fun, everybody can feel it, and that's what makes you believable is that it's true. Ha ha. It's not like it's the same show, like if you go see Van Halen it's the same joke night after night. Every show we did was something else, some other bullshit would come down. The thing is, on a daily basis, you just gotta handle your problems a day at a time, and that's it. You kick their ass and fuck it, you're on your way. So that was one of the problems in the end when it was really time to break up, it just sucked to go play, and at that point, I knew it was senseless, that there was nothing left. Cause in the end, Robo came to play in our band, and then we started doing that thrash shit. Robo was in the band, and when Robo left we had only learned five new songs, I think for the Earth A. D. Record, you know. We were just doing the thrash shit and it was kind of disheartening, you know. LT's fine for a bunch of skinheads that come to the show, but if I don't like playing it and Doyle don't like playing it, and it's really not the right direction for the band, why pursue it? Alright, do an Earth A. D. Album, but let's get back on track. That's why I was kind of surprised to hear Glenn's new stuff, cause it's not thrashy at all. Now you hear him, oh, they played 50 million miles an hour. Yeah, you fucking dragged us that way, you cow? You want us to play this thrash shit how do you play this thrash shit slow? Ha ha. The Earth A. D. Album is something of a bone of contention among Misfits fans, but while Jerry's dismissal of it as thrash shit may be a little harsh, the consensus seems to be that it is their most disappointing release. The power and violence of the music are intensified to a level where melody and song structure are smothered in a wall of overdriven guitar and feedback overdubs. Overall the standard of Glenn's writing is well below par. Cuts like Wolf's Blood and Hellhound are relentlessly powerful but virtually hookless, while other, stronger songs like Earth A. D. and Devil Lock are almost lost in the oversaturated production. That's not to say that there aren't some amazing tracks. Queen Wasp is a furious, blasting, buzzing tour de force, while Death comes ripping winds with distinctive wo o o sing-along backing vocals and a demoniacal arrangement of thundering drums, vicious guitar, and a finale that seems trapped in Hell's Whirlpool. Most inspired of all, though, is the staggering Green Hell, a ruthless exercise in dynamics that drags you from high-tension one-chord guitar and bass. Chug to explosive blasts of rapid change switch and yell. One of the most crushingly intense pieces of music ever committed to vinyl. At their best on Earth A. D. The misfits sound compelling and invincible, at their worst they just sound like noise. Unlike their other records, which hook you the first time, Earth A. D. Takes some gelling used too. Mike Stacks, Where Was Earth A. D. Recorded. The production is kind of a mess. Jerry only, you wanna hear something? We played the whiskey, Al's bar, and went right to record that album the same night, okay? The guys from Black Flag hooked us up, and we recorded at this place, it was a giant concrete garage which I love. I love a live sounding room because you just get some really great shit. That's how we got all those feedback tracks, throwing the guitars on the floor for the whole song. What happened was, when we were there, Glenn fell asleep. He didn't have nothing to do with the recording of the music. It sounded fucking like Motorhead on fucking speed. It was great. Motorhead had just done that Ace of Spades thing and shit this pissed all over it. Then what happened was, he went back and remixed it later on, and took all the fucking aggression out of it. If I was to play you the original versions, you would cry, you know what I mean? Mike Stacks, I don't think the record's bad. There's just so much noise on it that a lot of it's lost. Jerry only, well, the reason is he lost the basic tracks. The basic tracks got over swamped with all the extra. Mike stacks, yeah, there's all these guitar tracks and shit, 
but the bass and the drums are way back there? Jerry only, right, that's the problem. The problem was, okay, Glenn fell asleep cause we had just done two shows. Me, like I said, after I play, I get ecstatic, I'm in outer space it brings me to life. We went and recorded. We recorded the whole album, one take after the other just banged them, cause we were playing all night. I was never so loose in my life. I stood there in a pair of shorts, we put Robo in the middle, my amp's face in one side, Doyle's face in out the other. And me and Doyle stood right in front of the drum kit, watching each other while we were playing. And we played into this live room no padding at all. And the tracks came so good. I said to him, later on, Glenn, I don't really even like this shit, but we just kicked its ass. I said, not for nothing, but you got it. If that's what you wanted, it's on that tape. And that's how good it was. He didn't mix it until after the band broke up, and when I heard it afterward I wanted to cry because he ruined it. Mike Stacks, the die, die my darling 12 inch, did that come out after the band broke up? Jerry only, yeah. It was recorded, I think, at the same time we were with Robo in that room. Mike Stacks, cause that has a much better sound than Earth A. D. Jerry only, oh yeah. I think that had more of the original sound to it, without all the bullshit. You can hear the difference. Mike Stacks, so when you were doing Earth A. D, the band was basically starting to break up. Tell me how the breakup happened. Jerry only, well, the breakup happened because Glenn wanted to be the boss. The thing is, there is no boss, we were a team. Glenn would book the shows, I would pay the money to get us there, okay? He would manage it, but I would produce the band if the guy with the money is the producer, you know what I mean? In other words, he'd say, we're gonna play here, we're gonna play there. I would do all the mailings, all the t-shirts, all the kind of shit like that, out of my company. Basically, the money was my end of the deal, and performance, and gelling shit done. Oh, we need a stage, we need a van. We need this, we need that. I made everything go. I was the wheel of the whole project. So what happened was Robo split. When we came back from the last tour with Robo, what happened was, my mom said, Robo's nearly as old as I am. I really don't want him living by my house. Ha ha. I wasn't about low argue with her, cause. The thing was, we just put up a whole bunch of bands like Black Flag and Social Distortion anybody that was fucking in town wound up at my house. I had a pool and a basketball court and the whole deal. So you can park your bus in my backyard and spend the whole week if you have to. No problem. The thing was, Robo went to live by Glenn. Glenn wasn't booking any shows like he was supposed to, and Robo kinda got a little bored by that. The way I picture it is, Glenn invited Robo to be in the band, low move all from California the band should pay his fucking room and board. That's my opinion. Like if T called you up, hey, Mike, wanna play drums in my band? And you get out here and I don't book any shows, and I wanna charge you rent? Now that's pretty fucking stupid. So he started being a jerk to Robo. He would have Robo sit down and glue 45 sleeves. Glenn was a stickler at 72 cents. I told him, hey, listen, I work 12 hours a day, I build my own equipment, I practice with the band, I make sure the band knows what they're playing. I don't have time to glue 45 sleeves. I don't care what you're savin'. You don't want to pay to have them done that way, then you glue em. Ha ha. So he had Robo gluing 45 sleeves and first you have to cut em out. They weren't even cut out. So Robo eventually said, hey, fuck this. All I want is money for beer every night cause Robo would drink a six pack, watch TV, then go to bed. So Glenn wouldn't give him any money. Then he started hassling him about paying rent. Then Robo came to work for me, and he was making a paycheck, but when he went home at night, he didn't want to see a 45 sleeve. And Glenn, I didn't realize how jealous he really was of everybody, but it really rubbed him the wrong way that Robo was able to say, here. You want 50 bucks for rent? Here's 50 bucks. Leave me alone, I'm not gluing sleeves. You follow what I mean? So he kept picking on Robo, 
pushing him to fight him and shit. So Robo just came to me one day and said, listen, this guy's an asshole. I'm getting the fuck out of here. I like playing with you and Doyle, but this guy's just pushing me to the limit. I don't need this shit, I'm not getting paid. I said, well, Robo, I really don't blame you. So Robo got on a plane and split. Now Robo did that, and two weeks after that we had to play a show in Detroit for the Necros. They'd gone out in the cold and hung up posters and whatever, okay? Then two weeks after that we were supposed to go to Germany for the Earth A. D. Fucking tour. We were supposed to do a German album that Glenn was sending tapes to or some shit, and we were supposed to go low Germany and make some big bucks. So what happened was, this is four weeks before I got to leave for Germany. Now I just can't walk out of my factory for a month without covering my ass. I can go for a month, as long as no one needs anything I make. My factory still has to function. I ship about $10,000 in a day, I can't go for 30 days and lose $10,000 shipping for 30 days. That's 300,000 fucking dollars for me to go to Germany, you know what I'm saying? Ha ha. So I told him, listen, Glenn, if Robo's splitting, I think maybe you better apologize to him and ask him to hang, cause I don't have time. By covering my ass, it's gonna take me a month to cover my ass for a month. The bottom line is, if you wanna go away for three weeks, you gotta make three weeks worth of parts. You gotta cut and make those parts, besides what you've gotta make anyway. So Glenn's all, oh, I'll find us a drummer. So no drummers start coming around, and I tell him, hey, listen, Googie said he'll play the gigs, but he wants to get paid. If he's coming to Germany, he wants his cut and he wants it every night, which is fair. Googie got screwed over once before. But Glenn didn't want to play with Googie. He said I'd rather not play in this band if I gotta play with Googie. I said, okay, but if you get a drummer, you work him cause I don't have the time. And there's no way, if I tell you that, hey, the bass player and the guitarist have gotta work to cover their ass, you gotta break the drummer in. How are you gonna do it? Realistically? If we ain't gonna sit there and spend the time, there's no way that Glenn, with his limited playing ability, can teach a drummer how to play 35 fucking songs in two weeks. So I told Glenn, I said, okay, Glenn, no problem. If this is the way you want to play it, this is how we'll play it. You get the drummer, we'll practice, like, a week. We'll try and get as many practices in as we can. We gave him the benefit of the doubt, you want to be an asshole? We'll try it your way. So what happened was, we took the kid this drummer and we go all the way out to Detroit 18 hour drive. And we go to open with 20 eyes, and the kid gets nervous and can't fucking keep on beat through the whole song. We're playing in front of about 3000 people and we look like jerks. So what do we do? Doyle walked over and tapped the kid on the shoulder and said, fucking go backstage, and we use the drummer from the Necros, and he did the whole set. But me and Doyle, we just stepped back and sat on top of our amps and let Glenn handle the whole fucking show by himself, you know what I mean? Because without every piece being there, you can't get the job done. If you've got four wheels on your car and you take one off, how far do you go? Ha ha. You may get to the end of the block, but you're not gonna be able to go around the country. You wear it right down to fucking garbage within a hundred miles. And that's what happened. You can't pull a drummer out of a band two weeks before a big show in Detroit and four weeks before a fucking tour of Germany, and not be willing to deal with any old people who know your stuff. We had to teach Googie five new songs I could have done that in two weeks. Glenn had to step down off his high horse and deal with Googie, for the good of the band but he wouldn't do it. He could have told me in Detroit, you guys were fucking right, I was wrong. Call Googie, we've still got two weeks, let's go to Germany. That's what he could have said. He couldn't even admit that he was wrong. So when I saw that his ego was more important to him than the safety of the band, I realized that he's a shitty leader. I said, Glenn, you know, it's one thing to want to be the big guy. It's another thing if you suck at it. Ha ha. You don't make decisions based on emotional fucking opinions. If he would have come up with this kid, and this kid would have fucking cranked and we'd probably still be playing. Mike Stacks, did you ever get to rehearse with this kid? 
Jerry only, yeah. I did what I could. I had a show coming up in Detroit and I wanted it to be good. I wanted to believe that it was going to be a good show, you know? You need that. You need to believe that you can succeed that's what makes you try. Mike stacks, but instead it turned out to be your shittiest show ever or what? Jerry only, well, it happened to be Glenn's first solo show. We moved back and actually hopped on top of our amps and played our set sitting down because he'd betrayed the strength of the band. He'd betrayed all the basic rules which made our band what it was. The thing was, all he had to do was admit it. He never even admitted it to himself. He was wrong. He was so fucking wrong that it was so obvious, and all he had to do to fix it, say, look. I don't know what the fuck was in my head. Mike Stacks, some people just can't do that, you know? Jerry only, well, that's too bad. Then don't make a call if you can't accept when you make a bad call. So that's how the band ended up, and I haven't talked to him since. Mike Stacks, so after you got off stage that night, what happened? Jerry only, the kid got real drunk. Glenn wanted to leave the kid in fucking Detroit. Can you believe that? I told Glenn, I'll leave you here before I leave the fucking kid here. We drove back. And we were driving my truck with a U-Haul. So Glenn sat in the back with the kid and me and Doyle talked all the way back. We were talking about football. It was football season, so we had enough sports in our head to last us all the way home without any tension. When we dropped Glenn off, all he took was a suitcase full of clothes. His shit. He didn't own anything that the band owned. He didn't even own a microphone. Mike Stacks, so that was the last time you talked to him? Jerry only, yeah. Mike Stacks, have you seen him or anything? Jerry only, not actually face to face, but that doesn't bother me. He probably still won't admit it to himself, but we had a big opportunity with this band. I don't care how much money he, individually is making off his new projects. What we would have made as a band, he would have made more, if he split it with everybody. If it wasn't for us, sucking it up and putting out the cash, he would still be down in his mother's basement. I don't know what kind of following he is now, but I think he's sold out. I think he's just taking all the kids for a ride, selling them fucking bullshit. You don't sell devil shit to a bunch of young fucking kids. Why? Because it's selling? Invent a better hula hoop or something. You know? Mike Stacks, that's what I don't get about it. It seems like in the Misfits you had this whole horror thing, but it was always with a really good sense of humor. Total fun. Jerry only, right. That's it. Mike Stacks, now he seems to be taking himself really seriously with all this Satan shit. Jerry only, well, that's the problem, you see. The thing is, you gotta be able to laugh about yourself, to be open-minded enough to improve. Once you think that you can't make a fucking error, that's when you lose fucking imagination. You wind up stagnating yourself because you think you've got the answer. And the answer is something different for everybody, you know what I mean? It's a floating type of thing. What you believe is the best thing for you today, by the end of the week you may think that it's another way. But if you get too close-minded, he's playing his own song, that's all, and that's unfortunate. The thing that aggravated me was that a lot of the publicity about his band to make his band sound good was by slagging off his old band. How great's your new guitar player? Or how much do you hate the guys in your old band? What's your issue? Ha ha. What are you trying to tell us? Because the other band is a bunch of jerks, your band is good now? It's got nothing to do with the two. Ha ha. There's no comparison between the two. You see, he blew his big chance, but. No he's ripping off his new guys, I know everybody's on salary. Nobody owns a piece of his action. He's a one-man show. He'd rather be a big guy in a smaller bowl than a big fish in a big sea, and that's his problem. But I guess that's good because he's got the wrong attitude on what to sell, you know? The B-movie Misfits from the late 70s was the thing. He's still living in that shadow, and it's a shame that he thinks that he's taller than his old shadow, and he's not, you know? I think that he would have been much more successful if he would have worked with everybody that is on his side of the fence. I don't like people that need you when they need you, 
and if they don't need you they could give a fuck about you. I always found that that's shallowness, it's self-centered. I'm not that way, I never felt that way. I never felt that we were anything special one be pat on the back wasn't what it was about. It wasn't about everybody saying how great you are, and telling you, oh, you guys are cool, and all that. We liked doing it, and if everybody else liked it, that was great. But we never put ourselves above John Q. Public, you know what I mean? Cause you're not. The real heroes are the guys who get up and go to work every fucking day. That's hard. And that's precisely what Jerry does every day. He's kept very busy running his factory, where Doyle also works. In their spare time, they work on writing, playing, and recording music with their new band, Chris the Conqueror. Mike Stacks, musically, what's the story with what, you've done since the Misfits? Jerry only, we've improved our playing technique, we've improved our equipment, we've improved our outlook. We know what we want. What I want out of music is I want to enjoy it. When I play it, I want to like it. The thing is like I tell Doyle, you know. We try and practice and keep the thing going. The main thing is to produce something we're happy with. Whether it pays for you or it doesn't is not really the issue. The issue is that music, for the most part, people use it as a business. They play shit, they promote shit, they promote garbage because they're making money. So they don't really care about what they're doing and what they're playing. It's very misleading. I'm not gonna prostitute my love of the music for fame and fortune. I won't do it, cause once the fame and fortune take over then everything else winds up sucking. It's, like, you get one bad apple and throw it in there, eventually, you got a pile of fucking mush. It stinks, you know? And that's what happens. You get people harping on your money? You can't trust this guy, you can't trust that guy. It's a lot of fucking bullshit. There are a lot of real parasites in the music business, and there are a lot of fucking wannabe people who want to hold positions in their jobs. You know they fuck around, and I see it all the time. I got very little respect for the whole business. In a way, I feel that I got spared. A buddy of mine told me that he was talking to Glenn after Glenn started getting some cash, and Glenn said he still felt like he was missing something that even with the money it doesn't comfort you. Up here, we're tight. I got my kids, we're married, I got horses. We got it all. Mike Stacks, when did you get married? Jerry only, oh, I got married in 82 I had a kid when I was in the band. Now I got a family, and we do things. We go bowling or we go skiing we got ski slopes out here. It's perfect. If I was a big star, I'd have to be on the road all the time, and I wouldn't get to enjoy my family. So maybe I gotta work a hard day, probably just as hard as driving from town to town and playing a three-hour show but at the same time, I get to go home every night and sleep in my own bed, and watch my TV or take my dog down the football field and run around. Those luxuries, maybe to people who are big stars and shit they don't mind that, but that would bother me. I take it as it comes. The thing is, you gotta be happy with what you got. If you can be satisfied with what's dealt you, then you're gonna live a much happier life, just because you're not always gonna be one and shit you can't have, you know? So I try not to screw anybody over. I try to make good on all the deals I make. Sometimes I gotta pay through the nose, but I try to do that and keep my hands clean. Mike Stacks, what's behind the name of your new band, Christ the Conqueror? Jerry only, well, basically, I wasn't very happy with the Danzig project. Like he had the t-shirt printed up with the demon killing Christ, and shit like that. I kind of felt that was very misleading. The problem is, he's living off his misfits fame. He's in his own shadow and he doesn't even know it. The problem is, the kids that have just come up don't know about it. They think. Great band, and they see these guys and Glenn and they'll think that that's the same kind of thing we were into is what he's now into, and that just isn't the case. So I guess the name was a reaction to that to stuff it in their face. I knew it would be hard to work with, but I really didn't care and the logo is halfway decent. If you haven't heard my stuff, when you hear it you're gonna shit, cause I think it's the way the misfits should've gone. With Christ the Conqueror, Jerry, Mo the Great, 
and Doyle have traded in punk for heavy rock, but their goal is to still make music with the kind of power and energy that they use to unleash in the misfits. On their CO, cassette, they thunder through six hard rockin' songs with a force that would make most other heavy groups cower. In spite of all the bitterness surrounding the breakup of the misfits, Jerry speaks with real pride about his past. He knows that no matter what happens, he'll always be a misfit. Mike Stacks, why do you think it is that the Misfits' popularity has grown, even since the band broke up? Jerry only, to be honest with you, the thing about the Misfits, it's like American Pie and Chevrolet is what it is, it's meat and potatoes. It's doing powerful music, simplistic, to the point, and, at the time, it was coming from the heart. That was the whole thing. We believed we were doing great stuff, plus the fact that we were up against the odds. Nobody knew what we were doing. Everybody had no concept of what the fuck we were doing. Everything was not held back you know what I mean? Mike Stacks, as a person, how would you say you're different now from when you were in the Misfits? Jerry only, none. Ha ha. Mike Stacks, it didn't change you at all? Jerry only, no. It's pretty much a constant thing, you know? I try to do what's right and work as hard as I can at whatever the hell I've gotta do. That's pretty much it. I always have the same outlook.